By his look and the power of his presence, he affected subsidence of the mind and the experience of the one perfect reality. He often said that the true teaching was in silence. But this does not mean verbal expositions also were not given. And although he authorized many different methods of spiritual practice, he, however, laid the greatest emphasis on the path of self-inquiry. The first and foremost of all thoughts that arise in the mind is the primal I thought. It is only after the rise or origin of the I thought that innumerable other thoughts arise. Search by means of a deeply introverted mind wherefrom this I arises. If we go inward questing for the source of the I, the I topples down and immediately another entity will reveal itself proclaiming I, I. Even though it also emerges saying I, it does not connote the ego, but the one perfect existence. People of all religions came to him, and he never advised any of them to change their faith or abandon their creeds. He answered all their questions patiently, but in the end brought them round to the self. Know who you are, then all else will be known, he would say. To a question put to him about happiness, he replied, happiness is your real nature. You identify yourself with the body and mind, feel its limitations, and suffer. Realize your true self in order to open the store of unalloyed happiness. That true self is the reality, the supreme truth, which is the self of all the world you now see, the self of all the selves the one real, the supreme, the eternal self, as distinct from the ego or the bodily idea for the self. He never advised anyone to renounce their families or move to the forest. The obstacle is the mind, he would say. It must be got over whether at home or in the forest. And why should your occupation or duties in life interfere with your spiritual effort? By giving up activities is meant giving up attachment to activities or fruits thereof. Giving up the notion, I am the doer. The practice of his teaching doesn't require outward rituals or ceremony. It takes one straight to the source of one's own being which is the source from whence all religions spring and must ultimately resolve. It can be practiced by men and women of all walks of life, regardless of their environment. The Maharshi lived what he taught. In fact, his life was the most perfect demonstration of the supreme state of self-realization. And although he was fixed in the permanent state of pure awareness, his body was subject to the laws of nature. In time, it became afflicted with rheumatism and weakened with age. Early in 1949, a small nodule appeared below the elbow of his left arm. It was surgically removed. It later reappeared and was diagnosed as a malignant tumor which inch by inch ate up the flesh of his left arm, poisoned his blood, and finally rang down the curtain on a life of immaculate purity and grace. Throughout his final year, there appeared to be terrible suffering, but the Maharshi never complained. He seemed to be indifferent alike to the existence or non-existence of the body, being almost unaware of it. Devotees, seeing his gradual weakening and ominous symptoms, expressed their agony at his impending departure. He simply told them that they attached too much importance to the body, indicating that his influence was not limited to the diseased body they saw before him. When on April 13, 1950, a physician brought him some special medicine, he refused it, saying, it is not necessary. Everything will come right within two days.
The next day, a long crowd filed past the open doorway. The disease-racked body they saw there was shrunken, the ribs protruding, the skin blackened. It was a pitiable vestige of pain. And yet, at some time during these last days, each received a direct, luminous, penetrating look of recognition, which was felt as a parting infusion of grace. They say that I am dying, but I am not going away. Where could I go? I am here. He repeated this several times, implying clearly that the end of his body would not interrupt the grace and guidance. And that evening, moments before the end came, unexpectedly, a group of devotees sitting outside the hall began singing Aranachala Shiva. On hearing it, Sri Bhagavan's eyes opened and shone. He gave a brief smile of indescribable tenderness. From the outer edges of his eyes, tears of bliss rolled down. One more deep breath, and no more. There was no struggle, no spasm, no other sign of death. Only that the next breath did not come. At that very moment, an enormous star trailed slowly across the sky and disappeared behind the holy Arunachala hill. Many saw it, even as far away as Madras, and felt what it portended. It was exactly 8.47 p.m., April 14, 1950. Next day, a pit was dug and the body interred with divine honors. The crowd, packed tight, looked on in silent grief. A lingam of polished black stone, the symbol of Shiva, was consecrated over his tomb. Crowd dispersed.